Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Lint, and we're back for some more Gwent, and today we're going to be playing the new Entrenched Seasonal Event, which is an alternate game mode in which every unit and artifact that we play will gain resilience, so cards will stay on the playing field for an additional round rather than going straight into our discard pile. That means that there are some new and crazy combos for us to try out, and I think we have just the deck to do it. So let's take a look. So today we're going to be playing a Nilfgaard Double Cross deck, Double cross largely just because it has the largest provision boost and we have some really big cards that we're trying to squeeze in here. So some of the biggest things with this seasonal events are both getting cards that get stronger the longer they stay on the playing field and also using purification to remove the resilience from your opponent's cards. So we'll flip through the deck here to show you what we have and first off we have Masquerade Ball and the point here is not so much the poison for removal as much as it's the Thirsty Dames because they are arguably one of the strongest cards in this seasonal event because every opposing unit will gain resilience, and that means Thirsty Dames are just point machines. Then we have Sahil, which is another very interesting card because artifacts also gain resilience, even though it doesn't actually say that on the main screen. And so that means if you play this card early and say deal one damage to destroy a spy, then over time this can become extremely powerful. Then Letho, we have several options for things we can transform into. And Engulim, however you say their name, is also potentially very strong because Masquerade Ball is so good and it's going to be fairly common, as well as Sahil, as well as Ale of the Ancestors, which is a strong artifact that we did not have enough room to include in this deck. Caretaker is one of our primary sources of purification to remove all the resiliences on our opponent's units. Here is another strong card for us because if we can keep you in the melee row unlocked, that means we can get boosted whenever they get boosted, and if they are going all out of Masquerade Ball and Thirsty Dames, then this is a strong counter for that. Also, for that reason, a good target for Letho to transform into. Here's our defender to help protect things like Kahir, Masquerade Ball, Sahil, and others. Necromancy is primarily for if they either have a way of removing any Thirsty Dames that we play or any Thirsty Dames that we get spawned in from Masquerade Ball because those Thirsty Dames actually will not gain resilience. And speaking of Thirsty Dames, well, here's a couple. Duchess's Informant will of course give our opponent statuses to help boost Thirsty Dames, give us targets for Sahil, and also allow us to steal some of our opponent's better bronze units. Spores we have largely just because we actually don't have Yurden in this deck. This is a low provision cost alternative. And then Spring Equinox is, of course, for purifying every unit in an opposing row. So that way, at the end of a round, either if we're winning by a comfortable amount and we just want to totally decimate our opponent's round two plans, then we can use this. Or alternatively, if they are winning by a lot, we can use this to make sure that they don't carry over that momentum into round two for an easy round two win. Then we start getting to the low provision cost bronze units that we ideally wouldn't play too much of, although Nausicaa Sergeant, especially over the course of several rounds because it has resilience, will have plenty of time to get boosted up a lot. Thanks to the Empire, largely just a follow up to Masquerade Ball in case we happen to need more poison. Then more Aristocrats to trigger Masquerade Ball. And the Emissary and Mage Infiltrator, although not our strongest cards, are somewhat helpful in that they can help flood our opponent's side with one power units that they really don't want to have, because since units don't go away in between rounds, things get pretty crowded and they can potentially even run out of space. So there's a look at the deck. Overall, we have a nice combination of boosting with the Thirsty Dames and Kahir, as well as damaging with Sahil, so I'm excited to show you how it plays. Let's give it a shot. Okay, so going against monsters here, and they'll go first. Okay, and we have Ball, and we have the Aristocrats to trigger Ball. Though we also have a bunch of bronze for provision cost units that we could probably swap out. We may not need a Fangs of the Empire if we also have Ball going on, so maybe we dump you. Letho could even turn to a second Caretaker. Sure, and maybe we swap out one of you as well. That's just Informant, okay. So what do they get without Neuromancy? Oh, Ail the Ancestors, okay. So this is one of the really strong artifacts for this seasonal event. That's going to be a lot of boosts over the course of this match. So it would be a potential Heat Wave target if we had Heat Wave, but we don't at the moment. I think we even go with Thirsty Dame first here. And then don't worry, we'll still have enough Aristocrats with the Van Morlehem Hunters to trigger Masquerade Ball. Because this is going to be one of our key engines. And they will purify and destroy it. Okay. Understandable. So in that case, maybe we ease into things a little bit more if they're going to try to purify and or destroy the big cards that we play. So we could go with Nausicaa Sergeant.
Okay, and they do have dominance right now, so they will get boosted. So now, let's play Ball. And notice how the units that we spawn in with Ball do not get resilience. So that is a little bit different. That means it technically would have preferred to have kept that previous Thirsty Dame over this one. Okay, Yigger. Big card for sure. Do we have a way of shutting it down, though? Not sure we have enough damage to do that. But what we can do is we can certainly play the Caretaker. And this is another one of the key cards in this event because we can then proceed. Purify you, getting rid of that resilience. Okay, now they're going to turn around and purify us. So, we can either use Letho to turn into a second Caretaker and just purify absolutely everything. Or we could turn Letho into another Thirsty Dame, in which case we would get another engine out here. I think given how they have a reasonable size lead here, let's get a little bit aggressive and deliberately turn into another Thirsty Dame. That will trigger the next round of Masquerade Ball. And in doing so, who would we like to destroy? I think what we're going to end up doing is we're going to poison Yigurn. And then we're probably going to end up locking that Wild Hunt Hound, which we should do next turn. Okashe, even. For those units that it spawns in, I don't believe we'll end up getting resilience. So now let's use the Hunter to lock you. That should trigger last round of Masquerade Ball. Is that to get rid of Yigurn? And we have this Purification, which I think we probably do want to use on the Kashe. Now, of course, having locked the Wild Hunt Hound means that at this stage we probably don't want to purify it, but it is just a base three strength card, so it's not a huge deal if it carries over from one round to the next. Okay, the Cave Troll definitely would be a target for purification. Even Woodland Spirit, wow. This is our leader building. So what we could do here is because they want to spawn in those Indriga larvae in their melee row, we could play some of our disloyal units there just to crowd them out. Because that can get really frustrating if they don't have a way of removing those cards. And we do now have dominance, actually. So that means if we go Duchess's Informant, make our own Wild Hunt Hound, then that might not be a bad idea here. And then they'll play their Caretaker. Okay. More purification incoming. Gonna use it on... Looked like, yeah, Thirsty Dame. Understandably. So now they're out of room in their melee row. So that means probably a good thing that we did play the Duchess Informants. I mean, ideally we would have had even more time to squeeze in more of these guys to prevent even more of those from spawning. But we do still have dominance. So I think for that reason we keep on doing what we were doing before. Making more of these. And let's purify the Cave Troll. Okay, Alberon, he's big, although they perhaps would have preferred to have saved that. Oh no, and they don't have dominance. They are still triggering those thrives, so I think we deliberately crowd them out here. Go with the Emissary. And who would we like to boost? Maybe something in our melee row? And then Squirrel, they'll banish something in our graveyard. What even is it? Thirsty Dame. It's unfortunate. Okay, so for our last card, we have the Van Morlehem Hunter, which should be enough. In fact, we could even pass here, and our dominance would mean we'd get boosted by two, so we would be able to save one card. However, I think it is still worth taking a turn here to purify the Caretaker, because otherwise this guy's going to continue to purify our units and take away our resilience and that's not something we want them to be able to do long term so i think we do this even if it's a little bit overkill at least from a point standpoint and that means we gotta play you and that uh, shouldn't really matter here i don't think
So, okay, so we got Heat Wave, which we would have liked in round one. Defender plus Necromancy. And we do have a couple of Thirsty Dames in our graveyard, so that's why Necromancy is there. So we can still get some big engines back. So I do like this hand. However, in some ways, I think it's more of a setup for round three. Then again, because every card we play now is getting resilience, does likely mean we are still looking to play these cards here in round two. So I think we go with Defender first here. It's a little bit of the safer route. That way, when we do play Thirsty Dame with Necromancy next turn, we have a way of protecting it. And I think we should also go with Double Cross here, because, again, whatever units we play will gain resilience. When we get Oniromancy, or even Osrel, I kind of like Osrel, though, to steal their Yigurn. I think we go for that, because they definitely want to do that. So we just swipe this real quick. Yeah, and then the Bruxa will give us some bleed, but that's not a huge deal. And Ale the Ancestors, we could proceed to Banish now. It's not quite as powerful at this stage, so I think we're going to be fine here, especially since they no longer have as good of a target for Oswell. In fact, I think the best target they're going to have is either going to be a 7-strength Cave Troll or Caretaker, which is not anywhere near as good as this. So let's go with Necromancy next. And I was going to put a Thirsty Dame in the melee row, but in the interest of splitting our cards a little bit between rows, let's put you in the range row. Granted, it does mean it's no longer protected by Defender. Okay, so Oniromancy is their big card. Oh, okay. Reset and Purify. So, yeah, they more or less have to do that on the Defender. Is good. That makes us tied here, but we know their last card is an 8-strength Osrel. so if we Heat Wave on the Woodland Spirit, then they go down by 9. That Osrel will trigger the Thrive on the Bruxa. I think we're going to tie, and then because we won round 1, we'll win. My math might be wrong here, but I think that- oh, but then we had the Bleed. Oh, and Dominance, okay, but they cancel each other out. So here's Osrel. It's an 8. Oh, no. Oh, they had Ale of the Ancestors still. Okay, so not the end of the world, because as we can see here, we still have a Thirsty Dame, and that is huge. Though they do technically still have more points on the board than us right now. However, this can steal one of their artifacts, namely Ale of the Ancestors. In a short round like this, not a huge factor, but it is something. Then we could potentially use Oniromancy to get Sahil, and I think we definitely want to get rid of you. And that's eh, not great. Uh, neither is that. Okay, so another round of Thrive. It's not going to trigger their first Thrive. So the question here is whether we prioritize Ale the Ancestors with you, or if we prioritize Sahil with you. I'll tell you what, Sahil might not even be the answer here. It's not going to have quite enough time to power up, and we're going to have a one power target to destroy, but may not have a two power target. So I think what we do here is we actually go near Mancy into Kahir. And that way, they are going to be very reluctant to trigger those Thrives. Well, except they'll do that and more. So now let's get Ale the Ancestors out there. And we'll use this to probably boost Osrel. And then they'll purify. Not that that's going to matter much here. It's mostly the points that matter. And that means that one Fangs of the Empire is enough. Okay, so going against Scoyatel here. And they'll go first. And we've got Defender, Letho, Heat Wave, here even. But we have aristocrats when we don't have masquerade balls so i think that's not the best play here let's dump you guys and get our which could potentially give us masquerade ball it is still possible to trigger it if we are to turn into a second kahir using letho okay yeah i'm expecting dwarves based on how they're using mock and forge and i think that means they're gonna get pretty greedy with the boosts and therefore getting kahir potentially even Double kick here could be very good. So in that case, I think what we do is we go defender, ball, kick here, second kick here. I think that's the plan. 
And would we like to protect our Kahirs or our Ball? Because our Ball is probably going to go range row, whereas our Kahirs are obviously going to go melee row. I think we protect Kahir. So let's go with you first. And could, yes, go with Nausicaa Sergeants first, because they would get boosted if we were to play them before we play all these cards with the deploy abilities. But I'd like to prioritize getting Kahir down here as soon as possible, because they're going to get boosted by more than one every turn. Yeah. Definitely. See, uh, here's the thing. If you're playing them in the melee row, I was going to say, you don't need the resilience. You're getting that automatically. So now let's go ball. And this may get heat wave because we're not putting it behind the defender. But that's sort of fine. That's the risk we're taking. We basically said we would prioritize these guys over ball. Okay, and they're not heat waving it, at least not immediately. So now let's get Kahir down. So he'll get boosted every time they get boosted. And this will trigger the first round of Masquerade Ball. Let's keep all of our ball people up top here. And, I mean, we could deliberately poison you because you're going to be the biggest unit, at least other ones out there right now. Then again, you're the primary reason why we played Kahir. I suppose we go for it anyway. And they'll, oh, boost him. And give him a status, so that boosts us. But does mean now we can't get him with a second round of poison, so... Alright, fair enough. Does just mean you're gonna continue to boost Kahir instead. Okay, so now this might become our poison target now. So now here's where we go. Letho. Transform into Kahir. That triggers the last round of Masquerade Ball. We use that to poison you, and then we'll use Fangs of the Empire to finish you off. Defender, oh, where are you putting it? Melee or range row? Oh, you did go range. You did go range. Okay, so, a couple things we could do here. We could... Heat wave the defender if we really want to. It's a bit aggressive. That would allow us to then use Fangs of the Empire to finish off Yarpin. Alternatively, we could use Spring Equinox, because they now have a lot of units in that range row. Would purify everyone, getting rid of their resilience and getting rid of their defender here. Does, however, mean we'd also lose the poison, so we would no longer be able to take out Yarpin. Then again, we can reset him, so maybe we're okay with that. I think especially given that we have a lead now, we can stall a bit by playing Nausicaa Sergeants. Now, these would not be terribly good cards in this situation because we played almost every card that has a deploy ability. But because they have resilience, that means that in round two, they could still be decent. And if we continue to play other cards in the range row, if they have any source of purification, we'd like to bait them into using that on the range row. Because if we could keep those Kahirs and a defender in the melee row for round two as well, that'd be huge. Okay, so what are they going to play from their deck? Some Transformation. We do have some Rowdy Dwarves out there, so that does make some sense. I think we stick with another Nausicaa Sergeant here, because I'm trying to delay Spring Equinox as long as possible. That way, if they continue to play more units in the range row, we can purify all those units. Let's go with another one of these. It's not a huge play here, by any means. But it's enough for us to retake the lead, and we still have the Kahirs getting boosted whenever they get boosted. So even with the damage, I think we're going to hold on to that lead. Okay, more damage. We definitely would prefer for them to be focusing on the boost. So the other thing that I'm waiting to do is I'm seeing how high up you're going to get boosted, because Spores is becoming a better and better option against you. At most, they're only going to have room to play one more unit in that range row, so it would potentially be safe to play Spring Equinox here, although that actually would not be enough for us to pass them. So I think we deliberately go with a little bit of an early Spores in order to make sure that even if they immediately pass, we still take this round without having to play any additional cards. Okay, and they do pass. So that means we will take round one here on even cards, and, not to mention, we still have this set up here in the melee row. Okay, so we got round two of Necromancy, always big. Then Morlehem Hunter, which we may not want in Necromancy. We do now have a Thirsty Tame in our graveyard, so that's definitely what we're going to want to use that on. We're not going to have much in terms of other ways to get poison, so I think we swap you out and get another Thirsty Dame. Okay, that's very helpful. And I think we swap you and get another Thirsty Dame. 
So I was thinking about potentially playing an extra card in round one to get Spring Equinox to get rid of the resilience on all of these guys, but I felt like we had a strong enough advantage here that it wasn't going to matter too much, and I would rather just have that extra card, because that also means that now we can save this in case things don't go well in round two and make sure that they don't have a huge advantage going into round three. I don't love that our defender is really weak now, but I think what we go for here... So let's go Neermancy in order to get Sahil. Because that gives us a more damage-oriented path that we could take, rather than what we were doing previously, which was purely on the boost. So this way, even if they have a source of, say, resetting, could still be in decent shape. And they will, yeah, give that armor to you. Okay, well, well, however, that does now give us an easy target for Sahil, so I like that. And those Rowdy Dwarves... Oh, they do get armor. Okay, I was going to say it could potentially be the next target. Oh, no, but you don't Zoltan, so they are the next target in that case. Thank you very much. So let's start with these Thirsty Dames. Then we do this. Oh, but you do have the Defender out there. So yeah, we actually we need to Heat Wave first. So take your pick. Do you prioritize the boosting? Do you prioritize the damage? I think we do need to prioritize the boosting here because they do still have actually a somewhat sizable lead here. Yeah, if you want to boost all dwarves, that's going to backfire really quickly. Like that. So now we could, again, focus on the boosting with the Thirsty Dame, either directly or through Necromancy. Let's give Sahil some time to get powered up, though. So let's Heat Wave now to get rid of the Defender. And now we can destroy you and get Sahil a little bit stronger. Next target will, of course, be one of these guys. Which they are now realizing. And so they give one of them armor. And they'll maybe give one of the other ones armor with this. Yeah, they're deliberately trying to avoid Sahil. But but in doing so, we force them to boost themselves, which boosts Kahir. And since we have two of them, that means we are getting twice as many boosts as they are. So now let's go round two, Thirsty Dame. I'm going to deliberately put them in the range row because if they have any resetting, they're going to want to use those on Kahir. They have three cards in their hand right now, so I think we do use Leader ability. Because if it's a unit, we'll get that resilience. And we don't have much in the way of Dwarves, but... Again, if you're going to boost yourself, it benefits us more than it benefits you. And, uh, well, that does mean that this is rather difficult. I suppose we just go for you for the higher base power. And it doesn't really matter where we play you, I guess, here. We have a dwarf? What? Oh, I suppose you count. <laughs> okay, fair enough. But yeah, deliberately trying to make it so that if they do reset this row, then we still have stuff going on in the range row. Okay, now they'll use that to boost their Rowdy Dwarves. So yeah, they've deliberately tried to avoid Sahil. But in doing so, they've boosted themselves far too much. And now we've taken the lead. And now what we do is we go Necromancy into our last Thirsty Dame. And this one, you could potentially make the case for putting it in the melee row. The reason for that being if they have a way of purifying units in the range row, we'd like to keep at least something for round three. Then again, purification isn't going to be enough by itself for them to win this round. We're actually kind of okay with that. It's the resetting that is the most concerning. So I think for that reason, we do deliberately split our boosters across the melee and range row. And now we no longer have a great target for Sahil. Closest thing would be Rowdy Dwarf, but that's not enough to destroy it. Maybe we give you the damage in case things do end up going to round three, in which case you can destroy that guy in the next round. Okay, but again, Mahakam Guard, you don't want this. You don't want this. In fact, we know what their last card is. It's another Mockham Guard. We saw when we used our leader ability, and there's no way they can catch us with that. Okay, so going against Nilfgaard here, and they'll go first. And we have a Thirsty Dame. We have Caretaker. We have Letho. But otherwise, not loving this hand here. I think maybe we get rid of Fangs of the Empire. Get Defender. That helps a bit. Then maybe one of our Disloyal units. How about Mage Infiltrator? The Morlehem Hunter is something we'd like to save for Masquerade Ball, which we don't have here. Okay, they'll play their defender. And I think we do the same here, although admittedly this does feel like there's some risk of this being a bit of a wasted defender. Let's play you in the melee row in case we happen to get something like a here in a future round. Okay, Artorius Vigo. What will they create with him? 
My guess is maybe a Thirsty Dame? No? Oh, they're going for Purification. Okay. So that will mean no longer a Defender. Then again, we could turn around and create another Defender by having Letho transform into you. Alternatively, we could get some Revenge and use a Caretaker to Purify their Defender. I actually think we do go Letho here. Let's make another Defender. Because I'm anticipating potential Thirsty Dames and or Masquerade Balls. And those are worth a ton of points. So if we can get Kahir down here, obviously not this round, that's impossible. But in round two, at the very least, that's basically our counter for that. And except that being said, they have more sources of purification. Alright, so nobody's getting any defenders by the looks of things. Especially by the time we do this. Okay, they're using their leader ability. Our hand is not great right now. Thirsty Dame is almost certainly the best play. But they don't get it. They get the lock, which they should probably use on Caretaker here. It looks like that's who they're targeting. Yeah, they do. But then they go Hoakim. And with that, they get another big Assimilate unit. Okay, so it does seem like they're going more Assimilate than I expected them to do. Which means there's a decent chance they have a fair bit of Duchess's informants of their own. And so if we are to play a Thirsty Dame, they might turn around and play one themselves. We do have a Van Morlehem Hunter to lock that Thirsty Dame if they make one. So I think we still take that chance. Okay, well, they're going to go with Double Hokey. Makes sense. So this was going to be our resetting target, but we'll see what you get here. Uh, Damien is concerning. Probably going to want to lock him, actually. I would like for you to go away. Thank you. Okay, they have more purification. Are they going to use it on Damien? I think they are. Does, of course, mean that he will no longer have resilience in that case, but they can then reuse their leader ability. Although, tell you the truth, our hand is pretty bad at this point. So, for them to use their leader ability here would not be a terrible thing. In some ways, I'd strongly prefer them to use it in round one rather than wait in round two when we might have some better cards that we draw into. I think what we do is we start breaking out the Duchess's informants and create copies of some of their assimilate units, namely the ones that purify, because this way we can get rid of some of that resilience and uh, really just get rid of any of these guys. Because it's looking like they're going to take round one here. The key thing is just, can we find a way to make sure that they don't carry over too much value into round two? Actually, we should be resetting this row on the assumption that we'll use Spring Equinox on that row. So let's go here. Again, create one of you. Let's deliberately split a little bit across rows. We should purify you. Okay, and yes, in case it wasn't clear, they are in fact going all out assimilate. So I think what I'm planning here is we'll play Spores and Equinox this round, and then assuming they try to play all of their cards, we'll save Emissary as their last card, we'll pass when we have him remaining, and just swap him out because he's not really doing us any good here. Okay, and their most heavily boosted unit is you right now. Let's get rid of that. Drop you back down, which I'm hoping is enough to at least make them think that they need to keep playing here, even though we know there's pretty much no way for, for us to catch them. Okay, what do they see with Cantarella? We have some good cards still in our deck. Ah, uh, that's not what we wanted to see. Very much not what we wanted to see. That was a crucial card for us to counter any potential Thirsty Dame slash Masquerade Ball plays in round two. So that's really bad that we lost him. However, it is very important that we make sure that he does not carry over into round two. Because they had already won this round. That much was pretty clear. But if we don't purify him, then they could use him to win round two as well. And Uma's Curse, what are they going to get with this? We're not going to play this last card. So this is technically overkill, although they maybe don't realize it. Uh, do you even have Witchers? Okay, so they absolutely win round one here, but we'll keep that extra card. And now we get the big stuff. We get Sahil, Oniromancy, and Masquerade Ball. These are all the cards we would have liked 
in round one and combine that with the Kahir that was at the top of our deck at the end of the previous round that they stole. And this would have been a pretty awesome hand in that case. But uh, let's get rid of the Emissary. Infiltrator's not great. Thanks to the Empire. I uh, will... Okay, yeah, this is just going to be a dry pass from them, because as you can see here, we had more resilience than they did, so we still have more points than they do. But passing early here still is not a great play, because any unit that we play here will still have resilience. In fact, let's do that. Go near Mancy. Into Thirsty Dame, preemptively. Get you down. It does mean that's going to be hard to trigger Masquerade Ball, but we will be able to go Necromancy to bring back this one from our graveyard. Okay, and we drew into another Aristocrat here. So yeah, I think the plan is Necromancy to get a Thirsty Dame out of our graveyard. That'll be one Aristocrat. You'll be the second Aristocrat, so that'll trigger Masquerade Ball. Then that means we may not need these guys. I mean, that would be another round of actually deleting a card with Poison. But if we could get Necromancy in our hand rather than relying on Onirmancy for it, that'd be awesome. Not here. Okay, that could be decent if they happen to have a Masquerade Ball of their own, which of course we don't know yet, but... They may. So I think we do need to either go with Sahil first here or Masquerade Ball. And there's a chance that whichever one we play here is going to get destroyed with a Heat Wave. So maybe we start with Sahil because I don't think we have quite as good a setup for you. So if anything, we're trying to bait out a Heat Wave here. Because actually in round three, without having had any opportunity to charge Sahil up, it's not that strong in this situation. Ideally, we would have had it in round one or round two. All right, Brothens. They can create a Thirsty Dame here. Oh, actually, they go Emissary. And then they might steal Masquerade Ball or Neuromancy. Oh, well, they'll steal Masquerade Ball just in a slightly different way. Or it could be Sahil, actually. In some ways, we would prefer that. It is Sahil. They will be able to destroy you. But then there won't be any two power units to destroy. But, and, and you attack Thirsty Dame. Okay, well, that was just a misplay. So now we go Masquerade Ball. And we'll deliberately put you in the range row. That way we're splitting Thirsty Dames. Now, Arsahil doesn't have a great target here because you're the lowest power unit right now. Might eventually be able to destroy you with it, but that's not a huge play. If we were expecting to play Spies on their side, that's the best way to power it up. Those obviously have one strength, but uh, not this time. I don't expect that we are going to do that, so I think we just take the damage. And then they're going to Coup de Gras on the Emissary. Gotcha. And with that, are they going to boost? Yeah, I think they are. Not going to double down on the Brothens boost. Otherwise, Brothens would get huge. And possibly even to the point where we could try to find something with O'Neill Mancy, like a Heat Wave, to remove you. I think we're probably going to use our poison that we get from Masquerade Ball to remove Brothens. I think we'll lock you just because, I mean, at least for the moment, you are going to get boosted. If we're going to remove you eventually, that's not going to be a huge deal, of course. But there aren't exactly great alternatives to lock here. Okay, so assimilate as well on you. Now they get the right idea with Sahil. So we actually don't necessarily need to go Necromancy to get another Thirsty Dame to trigger the last round of Masquerade Ball. We do have the poison necessary to finish Brothens. However, Thirsty Dames are generally just worth a lot of points as well. It's a little bit late in the round for that to be a big factor. But I think given how we have the poison available to us, let's use it now. Then we'll see if we need the Thirsty Dames later. And then the damage with Sahil, I mean, there's really no great targets here other than just a target that actually takes damage and doesn't eat it with the armor. Okay, then this will probably be one of those Thirsty Dames, perhaps even the one that we are looking to bring back. No, actually it is not. It's an Emissary. Okay. Now, I'm not sure if they have any artifacts in the starting deck, because we, of course, have not seen any Masquerade Balls. We didn't see a Sahil of their own. So this might just be more or less a dead card, but I think we go for it here, and then we'll save O'Neill Mancy and keep wave whatever their biggest card is at the end. Oh, we also have our leader ability, which I totally forgot about. Uh, okay, well, it's not very big. I think what we do is Experimental Remedy. We take Duchess's Informant. Create a copy of you. That will trigger the Thirsty Dames. Give us an assimilate unit. Oh, then we need to play you, though. And confirmed. No artifact in their deck. This also finally gives us a target for sale. Granted, a little bit too little too late for that. Experimental Remedy. In their case, could be a Thirsty Dame. But uh, no, they're convinced that Emissary is the way to go. 
But at this point, Thirsty Dame doesn't have much time to get powered up. Okay, so our last card here, Oniromancy, I'm thinking, goes into Heat Wave. And in this case, we'd be removing you. And I believe we've seen their last card, right? And it was not anything that would be resetting our cards. So for that reason, I'm feeling pretty safe here. It's just battle preparation. That's definitely not enough to catch us. And so for that reason, we will merge victorious. So there's a look at a fun Nilfgaard deck for the new Entrenched Seasonal event. If you liked the video, then make sure to hit the like and subscribe button, and leave a comment down below to let me know which other cards, archetypes, and factions you'd like us to experiment with next. Thank you all for watching, and I'll catch you next time.